everyone and welcome back to the channel. The Yorkshire Dales has a wealth of incredible castles, listed buildings and abbeys that some of them are a little overshadowed. Most people have heard of Fountains Abbey, Bolton Abbey and Review Abbey, and yet Easeby Abbey is almost unknown and outshined by those three in the area. So why not join us as we explore Easeby Abbey and St Agatha's Church? Before we entered into the abbey itself, we just had to visit the stunning St Agatha's Church alongside the abbey. It is completely worth visiting and free on its own or with the abbey for its wonderful collection of 13th century wall paintings, which must rank among the best in Yorkshire and one of the most complete in all of England. The wall paintings were created around 1250 and were covered with layers of whitewash at the Reformation and amazingly only rediscovered in the 19th century. The paintings on the north wall of the chancel depict the Garden of Eden, with Eve being created from one of Adam's ribs, the serpent tempting the couple and then their dismissal from the garden. The final scene shows Adam digging and Eve spinning, whilst they are being rebuked by an angel. In the window, embrasures depict fascinating scenes of traditional medieval life, such as sowing seeds, digging and pruning a tree. There is also a scene of a nobleman hawking on horseback. These scenes are thought to be the traditional labours of the months, representing the traditional cycle of the seasons and its associated activities. Whilst the North Wall frieze is from the Old Testament, the South Wall murals depict New Testament scenes, creating a timeline of events. First you'll see the Annunciation, then the Nativity, followed by the crucifixion, the descent from the cross, Christ's burial and finally the discovery of the empty tomb. The details of these paintings are truly exceptional, but there are so many more to come. Against the south wall of the sanctuary is a triple sedilia that provided seats for the clergy during services. The back of each niche in the sedilia is painted with the likeness of a bishop. All of the 13th century paintings were executed in the secco method. Secco is Italian for dry, which makes sense because the paint was applied onto dry plaster, unlike frescoes when the paint is directly applied onto wet plaster. The history of the church is lost in the mists of time, but we know that there was once worship on this site as early as the 8th century. Nothing remains of that ancient church and the oldest parts of the present building date back to the early 13th century. The nave and chancel are from that period, but the cell file was added two centuries later. The first thing you see upon entering is the arcade that separates the south aisle from the nave. The arcade arches are painted with a chevron pattern in dark red. Also in the south aisle is a small chapel that is separated from the aisle and nave by a late medieval carved screen. Against the wall is a partial 17th century inscription and at the west end of the nave is a circular 12th century font decorated with blind arcading. In the nave is a replica of the Easeby Cross, the original of which is now preserved in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. The famous architectural historian Nicholas Perfsner called the Easeby Cross the finest piece of Anglo-Saxon sculpture in this country. And he may be right. The Easeby Cross dates back to the 8th century and is carved with a Celtic interlace pattern on the sides and biblical scenes on the front and rear faces. Tucked away into the corner is a very badly damaged statue of St Agatha which was probably defaced during the Reformation. There are several fragments of 14th century stained glass in the east window, one showing Our Lady and another depicting an angel. The church is just absolutely fascinating and quite unexpected on first glance.
In 1152, Rold, the constable of Richmond Castle, granted land to a group of pre Montretention cannons to build an abbey on the banks of the River Swale, within sight of the soaring towers of his castle. But Rold did not actually own the castle, but he did administer it on behalf of his patron, Conan, the Earl of Richmond. But Rold was certainly a wealthy man, probably through marriage to Garcia, the widow of Ersnian Murdoch, who held large estates around Richmond after the Norman Conquest. The new abbey may not have been the first religious foundation at Easby. Some circumstantial evidence suggests that there was a community of priests here in the early Saxon period, perhaps associated with a minster church. It is quite unusual that Rode chose to establish a pre Montretention house, though. The pre Montretensions were one of the smallest religious orders in England, and Easby was only the third abbey in the country to be established for them. The canons were not monks, but more ordained priests, and they did not take monastic vows and could perform religious ceremonies in which monks could not. So, why did Rode choose? to found an abbey for the order rather than, say, the Cistercians, who were by far the more popular order of the time. One possibility is that he couldn't, for in 1152 the general chapter of the Cistercians ruled to put a freeze on establishing new monasteries. Thinking that the order was expanding too quickly, Rold may have simply had to fall back on his second choice, religious order. The new abbey was dedicated to St Agatha and composed of core buildings for the monks to eat, sleep and pray, and a large number of outbuildings within a perimeter wall. The core abbey buildings included a church, sacristies for keeping vestments, holy vessels and written records, a cloister, a daughter or sleeping quarters, a toilet block, refectory, infirmary, chapter house, guest solar and an abbot's lodging. The subsidiary buildings further from the church included a variety of barns and outhouses, a bakehouse and a brew house. The precinct was entered through an impressive gatehouse built in the early 14th century. The gatehouse would have been surrounded by a high wall and the doors would be closed nightly. A porter of the abbey could, however, open them for guests who had been delayed on their way or even for pilgrims arriving after dark. The large gatehouses, like the one here at Easby, had rooms upstairs that could be used as offices or accommodation for the porter. Stores of items to be given as alms to the poor could be stored here so that they could then be dispensed without the poor needing to enter inside the monastery. Alms were given out from a covered porch on the other side of the gate. Another use for this space on the upper floor was used as a prison. Prisons were used to punish disobedient monks. In addition to the buildings for the monks to live and work, they constructed a hospital for 22 poor men. In those days a hospital was simply not a place to heal the sick, but it could also serve as a sort of retirement home or social housing, under the sponsorships of a religious house. Rold initially endowed Easby with just two caricates of land, really not enough for a community of canons, so a local knight named Richard granted another charter to Easby, and seems to have considered the abbey his own foundation. The Earl of Richmond added another four caricates of land and endowed Easby with the profits of the Richmond Fair. The canons slowly created an income based on sheep farming, and eventually purchased the land that would then become Easby Manor. In the 14th century, the powerful Scroop family of Bolton Castle in Wensleydale became patrons of Easby. The Scroops were also buried at Easby, and surviving niches in the Abbey Church are thought to be the remains of the Scroop family tombs. The Scroop tombs must have been quite impressive. The Abbot of Easby was called as a witness in a court case in 1395, and in the court it records he describes the tombs of Henry Scroop and Lord William Scroop in detail. The Scroop family paid for the chancel of the church to be heightened, and in 1392 Sir Richard Scroop granted extensive lands to the abbey, greatly increasing the abbey's wealth and status.
One interesting story attaches to Easby. In the late 15th century, the head of the Premont's retention order in England was Richard Redman of the Abbot of Shap in Cumbria. On one of his regular visitations to Easby in 1482, he was called upon to investigate the case of the canon, named John Nim, who had run away when accused of having improper relations with a widow named Elizabeth Wales. Redmond ruled that when John was found, he should be brought back before a tribunal. John was indeed found, but he was proved to be innocent. He was accepted back into the community of canons, and in 1492 he was named abbot. Easby's time of prosperity in the period of the Scroop patronage must have come to an end, for Redmond found the abbey in debt, even though it was well maintained. However, the abbey never did recover its wealth, and by the time the abbey was dissolved by Henry VIII, the number of canons living at Easby had diminished to just 11. The end came in 1536, making Easby among one of the first monasteries to be dissolved. The land was then let to Lord Scroop of Bolton. In October of 1356, Easby was caught up in the turmoil of the Pilgrimage of Grace. This popular uprising, centred in the north, attempted to reverse the tide of Reformation and appeal to Henry VIII to reinstate Catholicism. One of the centres of pilgrimage was Richmond, and in December of 1536, the town's bailiff had reinstated the canons at Easby. But Henry was not to be discouraged from his course, and his vengeance upon the rebels was ferocious. He instructed his military leader in the north, the Duke of Norfolk, to cause the monks to be tied up without further delay. Tied up in this case meant to hang them but we have no record of whether Henry's sentence was carried out at Easby, or whether the canons were allowed to just scatter. Within only two years, many of the abbey buildings had been destroyed and stripped for building materials, especially their lead roofing. However, enough of the abbey remained intact for it to become a popular destination for artists, including J.M.W. Turner, who was inspired and drawn by the romantic ruins and the picturesque surroundings. But the abbey was in constant danger of being raided by the Scots and were obliged to call in the English army for protection, which they got, but at a fearful cost. In 1346, an English army, on its way to the Battle of Neville's Cross, was stationed at the abbey, the soldiers spent most of the time in drunken brawling and inflicted as much damage as the Scots would have done. In the late 1530s, Henry VIII dissolved all of the monasteries. The abbey was abandoned and left to fall into ruins. Although some of the best features were salvaged, the fine canopied choir stalls are now found in Richmond Parish Church. The Abbey itself is free to visit and is a hotspot for people to park up their cars and indulge in a spot of walking through the forest, as well as enjoying a four-mile circular hike that takes you through to Richmond Castle, around the River Swale and to Easby Abbey. Not far along the route you will come across the Drummer Boy Stone. Legend has it that towards the end of the 18th century, soldiers in Richmond Castle discovered a tunnel under the keep that it was built on, as an escape route in the event of Scottish raids. The story goes that the Drummer Boy was sent into the tunnel, and the other soldiers marched above, following the route by the sound of the steady beat. After around half a mile in Easby Wood, they heard no more drumming and the drummer boy was never seen again. The stone marks the place where the drumming ceased. Is this legend true? Who knows? But it's a very sad yet interesting story that continues to tell its tale. There is also free parking at the Abbey itself, but it runs on charitable donations. So if you are going to visit, it's worth popping a few quid in the donation box to help keep St Agatha's Church open. The area is absolutely beautiful and is worth a stop off or a tick off the list when it comes to exploring England's heritage. So that's it for this week. We really hope that you've enjoyed our visit here at Easby Abbey and St Agatha's Church as much as we have. If you have, please be sure to click that like button, consider clicking the notification bell and hit that subscribe button for more content. If you're interested in helping us travel further and supporting the channel, 
please consider our Patreon or by clicking the join button below. We want to say a massive thank you to our Patreons and to our channel members for being a part of the PIM family. So we'll see you in the next one. Till next time. <laughs>